Welcome everyone to this first lecture in the introduction to banking in this winter term 2020 in this very unusual year here at Leipzig University. Uh, my name is Gregor Weiss. I'm a professor of finance here and chair in sustainable finance and banking in the Faculty of Management and Economics at Leipzig University. And this semester, uh, as uh, every winter term, um, I'll be teaching the introduction to banking. Um, we'll start with some background in the course organization. Um, I will tell you a little bit about where you can download the slides, where you can get some additional information. And as you can see from the outline, um, we'll start even today with a short introduction and some basic characteristics of the German banking sector. And we'll continue with some theory. Um, this is one uh, difference, I guess, between universities of applied sciences and uh, full universities that will also deal with some economic theory in banking. We'll talk about uh, the uh, most famous models that explain the existence and the functions of banks. Um, banks obviously are connected to central banks. So in the third section, we'll talk about central banking and then continue because this is still a business class. We'll talk about the business models, uh, the different income sources for banks, and then continue to financial accounting, risk management and regulation before ending the lecture with some special characteristics of foreign banking systems, most notably not the German banking system, we'll deal with this one today, but with the US and maybe even the Japanese banking system. Okay, so let's start with the uh, course organization. Uh, you've probably noticed that um, usually we would have three hours um, that consist of two hours lecture and one hour tutorial. Uh, the one hour tutorial will be given um, in probably December and January. Uh, stay tuned for the information to pop up um, in the Moodle class. Um, but we'll have a two hour weekly lecture here on every Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, via Big Blue Button. Um, and for obvious reasons, we'll have this one virtually via Big Blue Button. Um, introduction to Banking is an elective course in our bachelor's degree in economics. Uh, you can get five ECTS points and it will conclude with a written exam that takes 60 minutes. Uh, we'll have some previous exams uploaded to the Moodle class so you can get a better idea of what the exam will look like. If you're an Erasmus student, if you're an exchange student uh, here at Leipzig, uh, you can take the class and you can either take the regular exam at the end of the semester, or you can write a term paper, which we here call Erasmus paper, and earn the five ECTS credit points. Now, please keep in mind that the reset exam is at the end of the summer term. So if you fail, the exam, you will only be able to earn the credits in the summer term, which would mean that you have to take the exam probably in July, early August 2021. So keep this in mind when planning your academic year. All this lecture is supported by a lot of e-learning actually. Um, most of the information can be found in our Moodle class. Um, you've probably noticed by now that all these lectures are recorded and I will upload them on YouTube. You can already watch some previous lectures from previous semesters um, on YouTube, but every year is slightly different. The slides change from time to time, um, but also I do um, put a different focus on some topics from time to time. So it probably wise to watch the videos from this semester and only if you have too much time watch the old ones as well. If you want um, to come to my consultation hour, you can um, make an appointment via Calendly. This is a link uh, just by uh, clicking on this link. Uh, you will be prompted to my Calendly website and then make an appointment. This semester, until we get a vaccine for COVID, it'll probably be uh, via um, Skype only. And you can, of course, write me an email at vice at vifa.uni-leipzig.de. All the lectures are recorded and you can click on this link here, on this uh, huge YouTube link, 
and you will be uh, directed to uh, the YouTube channel and you can subscribe to the channel but all those videos here in the introduction to banking are also uh, made available publicly so you shouldn't have any problem finding the videos on YouTube. If you're more interested on my research, if you're more interested on some uh, current events and current topics in the economic discussion on banking, banking regulation, uh, you can also uh, follow me on Twitter. Again, also by clicking on this logo here. And I've just seen that uh, the first one of you has already subscribed to me via Twitter and is following me on Twitter. So thanks for that. E-learning, uh, we also, last but not least, we have two mailing lists. Uh, we have one, uh, this first one, uh, at Banken. Um, it might be that some of you are not uh, subscribe to this lecture or via our system AlmaWeb. If you're not on AlmaWeb, I cannot really send you any information via email, so it would be wise if you subscribe to the AdBanken mailing list. And also, I will not be um, redirecting job openings and job advertisements via uh, AlmaWeb, at least not the ones from external um, companies, uh, only internal job openings. But if you're interested in receiving job openings for internships, for student jobs, um, but also for training positions and starting positions, please subscribe to the Jobs Bank Fin mailing list so that you can get these um, job openings. Okay. Now with the basic literature in this class, um, again, this class used to be held in German. I switched to English some time ago um, and if you look at the literature, especially at the textbooks at the, at the beginner's level, at the bachelor's level, it's very difficult to find a good textbook on banking. There are some around that are in English. Um, I don't particularly like them. Uh, we do have a very good book um, in German that is Bankbetriebslehre, the German word for banking, written by uh, three colleagues, Hartmann, Wendels, Pfingsten and Weber. In Germany, this used to be the standard textbook on banking, and I think it still is. It's pretty good in many parts. I don't particularly like some parts of it, but most of the um, most of this textbook book is actually pretty good, and um, large parts of this lecture are based on this textbook. Um, I have to give you a disclaimer: you don't need to read an additional textbook. The slides should be sufficient for you to follow this introduction and the exam will of course be based on the textbooks, uh, um, no, on these slides only. So you don't need uh, to read these textbooks along. But of course, if you're more interested in the topics of banking, then I would advise you to uh, every now and then have a look at one of these textbooks. So the first one is Bankbetriebslehre, Banking by Hartmann, Wendels, Pfingsten, Weber, the standard textbook on banking, I guess, in Germany. The second one is Bankbetriebswirtschaftslehre by Guido Eilenberger, also a German book. This one is even um, easier to read and it is probably somewhere between uh, an apprenticeship and a bachelor's degree. So it's somewhere between the German Lehre and Bankausbildung and a bachelor's degree. So at many points this textbook is um, has a more practical approach. Uh, it is softer on the theoretical side so you don't, don't expect this book uh, to offer you any theoretical insights into banking. It is very practice oriented, but this doesn't need to be bad. So every now and then you can take a look at this textbook um, and uh, have um, an insight into the practical side of banking. Okay, so what I'm trying to do in this lecture is I want to give you an introduction to the very basic principles in banking. You should know what is a bank, why is banking special from other fields, from other sectors. Uh, you should know the uh, peculiarities of the German banking system. Um, we'll be also be talking a lot about the US banking system, but obviously the focus of my class is on the German banking system. But um, you will learn 
general theories for the existence of banking. You will learn general principles in central banking, in risk management, in bank regulation. So at the end of the semester, you should have a good overview of what banks do, what banks are, why banks are special. Um, and from then, concentrate more on, say, risk management in financial institutions, regulation, etc. So this is what we'll be uh, dealing with here in the introduction to banking. Um, one disclaimer and one caveat uh, I have to mention is that because this is a class on the um, German banking system, uh, all the examples when it comes to banking law uh, will of course be German. This will be German law, German regulatory statutes, and uh, this is uh, from time to time, this is a little bit weird because we will be talking about German laws in English. Um, and um, this is, I guess, the best way to handle this. Uh, you can always look at the original German legal texts, um, but you will also find the English translations here on the slides. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to talk about, the course organization. Check Moodle, please. Um, you can watch the videos on YouTube. Uh, we'll have a 60 minute written exam if there is no change due to the pandemic, but let's assume that we'll have a 60 minute exam at the end of uh, probably uh, in February. And um, yeah, I hope you um, have fun in this class and learn a lot about the German banking system and banking in general. So let's start with um, the introduction now, uh, some basic characteristics of what is a bank, what uh, is so special about banking, and uh, later on what um, is so special about the German banking system. So first we need to define what is a bank. Every one of you knows what a bank is. You've already seen a bank. Uh, you're probably a customer of at least one bank, but we need to find a general economic definition, but also later on a legal definition, because um, it does make a difference if you are legally a bank or if you are not. Uh, the recent scandal about Wirecard uh, is just a um, just the most recent example where um, probably a company which should have been uh, regarded legally as a bank uh, wasn't really a bank, uh, at least not for the German regulators and supervisors. So um, this is not an academic, not just an academic discussion, but uh, this is also very important from a legal standpoint. So in general. What are banks? Banks are companies um, in its most basic form that take on deposits and that give out loans. So you have deposit taking on the one hand side and you have lending business on the other hand. Kreditvergabe, lending and Einlagengeschäft, deposit business, deposit taking. So obviously this only applies to a certain subset of banks because there are many many more banking services that can be offered we'll be learning about these banking services later on but at this point um, it is sufficient to say that if you start out by taking in deposits and if you give out loans you are a bank and you see that banks actually have similar properties as uh, financial markets and they compete with financial markets in a number of ways. So we need to define financial markets before and then distinguish a bank from just any other financial market. And in finance we say that a financial market is a market on which financial contracts are traded. Um, well, we start out by defining the first term by inserting a second term that you might not be familiar with. What is a financial contract? A financial contract is simply a claim uh, to present or future payments, to future cash flows. So if you have a claim to a present payment or a future payment, this is a contract that will be considered a financial contract. In German, we also say Finanzkontrakt. Finanzvertrag sagen wir seltener, wir sagen eher Finanzkontrakt, financial contracts. It's very general. Anything can be a financial contract. It could be a stock, it could be a bond, it could be a loan. And that's why we define it in such a very general way, because we want, uh, we need one term that covers everything, a bond, a stock, a loan, etc., even a deposit contract. 
So that's a financial contract. And if you are on a market in which financial contracts are traded, this is considered a financial market. Now, in simple terms, financial markets are the place where you have lenders and borrowers, where they meet, they exchange payments. So it is clear that a bank is something similar to a financial market. They have similar functions. But in contrast to a trading platform, so a financial market such as a stock exchange, a bank itself appears as a market participant on that particular financial market. So yes, banks and financial markets are quite similar. They have similar functions. But one important distinction between a bank and a financial market is that the bank itself appears as a market participant on the financial market. So let's then define a financial intermediary because this is actually what a bank is. It's a financial intermediary that intermediates between borrowers and lenders. So in a strict sense, a financial intermediary is an institution, is a company that receives capital from lenders and it passes it on to borrowers. For example, other banks, insurance companies, venture capital funds, etc. And in a broader sense, a financial intermediary only makes trading financial contracts possible or easier. So what does this mean? A stock exchange is already a financial intermediary in the broader sense, and Finanzintermediär im weiteren Sinne. Why? It facilitates trading of financial contracts, makes it possible or easier. So a stock exchange is a financial intermediary in the broader sense. In a strict sense, and Finanzintermediär im engeren Sinne, is a company, is an institution that receives capital from lenders and passes it on. So it intermediates cash payments. That's a financial intermediary in the strict sense. We have this um, plot here that's still in German, uh, so that you already and also learn the German words for this. You have um, the borrowers and the lenders, Kapitalgeber, Kapitalnehmer, and they give out loans and they receive loans and the bank facilitates this. The bank is the intermediary that is put in between lenders and borrowers. And for some reason, it makes sense to have a bank between borrowers and lenders. At this point in the lecture, we do not know why. It could be that the bank is completely obsolete. It could be that this is simply um, a company that uh, only rakes in rents and uh, a company that could be substituted. Now, we know this from many other companies and many other markets. Um, you probably know that uh, the internet, when the internet um, was introduced and uh, at the start of the millennium um, increased its importance, many intermediaries vanished because you could see that you can directly, for example, uh, order some products from the manufacturers. You don't need intermediaries. This could be the same here. Why do we need a bank between the borrower and the lender? There should be a good reason why the bank offers a service to both the borrower and the lender so that the bank uh, has a right to exist. And this is what we'll be dealing with probably next week and the week afterwards. Uh, we'll be talking about theories that explain or that try to explain the very existence of a bank. At this point, we simply accept the fact that there are probably pretty good reasons why banks exist and the bank exists right between the borrower and the lender. Okay. This is um, the first way of defining what a bank is. But in the end, in every country, um, it's pretty much a question of um, a legal definition. It's a question whether you are a bank under the law of that particular country. So let's look at the German Banking Act. Um, we translated it into a German Banking Act because this is what it's pretty much it. Um, it's the KWG, the KWG, Kreditwesengesetz, um, and this is the, Ger the German Banking Act. It's the one law that regulates everything that is um, concerned with banking in Germany. And in paragraph one, section one, sentence one, so at the very beginning of the German Banking Act, uh, credit institutions, Kreditinstitute, are defined as banks, companies that conduct banking operations commercially 
or on a scale which requires commercially organized business operations. Um, many things are important to note here. First of all, we don't particularly speak of banks. We usually talk about credit institute, credit institutions. That's the word that is used in the German Banking Act. Second, the definition doesn't really help at first because it simply says a bank is a company that does banking. And that's not helpful at this point, but it is important to stress that first of all, it needs to be done commercially which means that if you give out as a private uh, person, if you give out a loan to a friend uh, on an unregular basis and you don't do it commercially, you don't do it as a business, you're not automatically a credit institution. And second, if you're doing it on a scale which required commercially organized business operations, so if you're renting an office, if you need staff, etc., then also you're a bank. So next, uh, we need to know what are the banking operations and this is where paragraph one section one sentence two of the German banking act helps us it says that it actually um, it enumerates all the different banking operations and it starts with deposit business so first deposit business acceptance of funds from others as deposits or unconditionally repayable funds from public unless the claim to repayment is securitized in German, verbrieft, in the form of bearer or order bonds. So in on contrast to bearer bonds, order bonds are made out to the name of a specific creditor. They can be transferred by endorsement. Um, in German, bedeutet dies einfach nur, dass dies, um, diese Anleihen, das sind ja Bonds, dass diese Anleihen auf äh, bestimmte Personen oder Institute gezeichnet sind und dementsprechend steht da der Name drauf. Die können dann natürlich nicht so leicht äh, übertragen werden, müssen dann mittels Indossament übertragen werden. Uh, irrespective of whether or not interest is paid. So if you accept deposits, um, you're a bank. So if you do deposit business, if you accept deposits from customers, you are a credit institution. Full stop. Second, 1A, Fundbrief business. There is no English word for Fundbrief, this is a German one. Um, it is the business specified in the German Fundbrief Act. Uh, I haven't found a very good translation for this. A Fundbrief is an interest bearing security that is issued by a mortgage bank usually. And next to the solvency of the issuing bank, in case of default, you also have additional collaterals, for example, mortgages, claims against the state, bonds, ship mortgages, etc. Um, Fundbriefe sind eine besondere Art von Anleihe. Wenn Sie eine Anleihe emittieren, dann sichern Sie ja als Emittent mit Ihrer Bonität um, das Risiko und das Ausfallrisiko dieses, dieser Anleihe ab. Was man bei Pfandbriefen macht, ist, man verfendet dort noch zusätzlich andere Forderungen oder aber Staatsanleihen oder Schiffskredite oder ähnliches, sodass die Anleihe doppelt abgesichert ist. Zum einen durch die Bonität des Emittenten und noch durch zusätzliche Sicherheiten. Und Pfandbriefe sind dementsprechend als besonders sicher anzusehen und der deutsche Pfandbriefmarkt äh, war und ist auch sehr groß gewesen. Wenn Sie Pfandbriefgeschäft betreiben nach dem äh, Pfandbriefgesetz, dann sind Sie Kreditinstitut. So if you're doing Fundbrief business, if you're engaging in um, issuing these kinds of extra collateralized bonds, then you are a credit institution. Credit business, uh, section two, if you grant money loans and acceptance credits, um, also Wechsel uh, und Akzeptkredite, um, then you're a credit institution. Discount business, uh, purchase of bills of exchange and checks, uh, discount brief and discount geschäft, principal broking, uh, brokering service, purchase and sale of financial instruments in the credit institution's own name for the account of others. So this is, um, this is also uh, a banking operation that will qualify your company as a credit institution under the German Banking Act. Five, six, seven, eight. You can see that it is a long list. 
uh, there are many things that are enumerated in paragraph one, section one, sentence two of the Jam Banking Act. Uh, and if you engage in any one of these operations, you will be considered a credit institution. There are some things that have been repealed, for example, e-money business. Why? Because e-money business used to be something very, very old um, that is nowadays, uh, that has actually become very um, current again. Um, you're probably not as old as I am, uh, so you don't remember this, but um, a long time ago, um, banks had already started to include something like uh, a digital wallet on your euro check, uh, on your banking cards. Uh, it used to be called Geldkarte. And the difference was that if you in Germany, if you pay with your banking card um, or a credit card, this is basically you're giving a company, you're giving a shop the right uh, to withdraw some money and request some money from your checkings account, from your bank account. So what you're legally doing is you're assigning out a right to this shop to request some money from your account. So it's not really money that is exchanged, but you're giving out, um, you're signing a contract that the shop can request some money. With e-money, with the former Geldkarte, it was different. You could save money on your chip card and if you lost your banking card, the money would have been lost as well. So it's more closely related to what we would now consider a digital wallet. That used to be called E-Geldgeschäft in Germany. And this one has been repealed uh, because it's no longer really current. And uh, now it's uh, a little bit different. Okay, so if you engage in any one of these uh, banking operations, you will be considered a credit institution. Now, in addition to the list of banking operations, the German Banking Act, the KWG, the KWG also distinguishes between different kinds of credit institutions. The first one is a deposit-taking bank. This is a credit institution which operates, operates financial commission business as well as credit business, especially Einlagengeschäft. This is important. Uh, Einlagen, actually you have to now the German word. The deposit taking bank in paragraph one section 3D of the KWG uh, distinguishes credit institutions from um, a deposit taking bank. Why? Actually the deposit taking bank, the Einlang Institute is the strictest and the most important form of a credit institution. You can be a credit institution if you only do, for example, financial commission business or if you engage only in Pfandbriefgeschäft. Um, but if you accept customer deposits, then you are a full bank. You are a bank which should be hit by the full force of financial supervision and regulation. That's why the German Banking Act uh, is, um, particularly stipulates that if you accept deposits, you're a deposit-taking bank, and then you will have to face full regulation and full supervision. If you sometimes hear the word um, uh, Vollbank Lizenz in German new newspapers, so full banking license, this means that uh, the German banking supervision has accepted you and considers you to be a deposit-taking bank because this is probably the most important and most dangerous type of bank that needs to be supervised. If you operate financial commission business, um, investment brokerage, but if you're not a deposit taking bank, then um, you're a securities trading bank. And we also have so-called e-money institutions if you only operate e-money business. Okay, so let's continue. Um, can you call yourself a bank, a banker or a savings bank, bankier, bank, sparkasse, etc.? No, uh, all these terms are legally protected by paragraphs 39 and 40 of the German Banking Act. 
so you cannot simply open a company and call yourself a Leipzig Bank. Uh, that's not allowed. Uh, if you operate under the name, uh, under the legal name with bank, banker or savings bank, you need an authorization of BaFin to conduct banking business. What is BaFin? BaFin is the federal financial supervisory authority with its headquarters in Bonn and uh, a second office in Frankfurt. And it's the Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht. We'll talk a lot about financial supervision in Germany later on, but at this point it suffices to say that BaFin, together with the European Central Bank and German Deutsche Bundesbank, is the head financial supervisor for credit institutions, insurance companies, and also other, other financial service companies in Germany. Now, same with um, Credit Union or Volksbank in German and Savings and Loan Bank, so-called Spa and Darlehenskassen, you cannot simply open a business and call yourself a Volksbank or a Sparda Bank. Uh, these terms are protected and they may only be used by credit institutions that operate in the legal form of a registered cooperative society belonging to an audit association. What is that? This is the German EG in einem Prüfungsverband. What does it mean? EG is the German word for a cooperative, registered cooperative, uh, eingetragene Genossenschaft. Um, and it means that you do have stockholders, but all the stockholders are only allowed to uh, own the same share in the company. And this is a very socialist type of legal form, actually, uh, socialist type of business. And it's a registered cooperative. And uh, it, um, in einem Prüfungsverband, so if it belongs to an audit association, means that all those small credit unions have formed together an association that is responsible for um, for a standardized auditing of all those different credit unions. Okay. Same with savings bank, Sparkasse, may only be used by public savings banks and the so-called free or independent savings banks, sind die freien Sparkassen, es gibt einige Sparkassen. Die Besonderheit ist, um, this is very, very German peculiarity, um, Savings bank uh, Sparkassen are usually banks that belong to a legal, uh, to a local, um, um, to a locality. For example, to a county or to a city. For example, here in Leipzig, we have the city savings bank that is owned by the city of Leipzig. Uh, in similar large cities, uh, usually we have two savings banks. One Stadtsparkasse, which is the savings bank of the city, and one Kreissparkasse, a savings bank that is owned by the county. Um, these banks are publicly owned. These are government owned banks. There are a few banks, a few savings banks that are not owned by um, a local entity like a city or a county, but they are actually owned by themselves. So they have a foundation and a Stiftung and the savings bank is in the possession of that foundation. This is why some of these very few Sparkasses, very few savings banks are called free savings banks, Freie Sparkassen. I think this is the case uh, with Haspa, the Hamburger Sparkasse. Um, we also have some other names and some other terms, Building Society, Bausparkasse, Kapitalanlage or Investmentgesellschaft, so an investment company. These terms are also protected, so you cannot really form a company and call yourself a Bausparkasse. If you do, you are supervised by BaFin and BaFin will have to give you uh, an authorization, will have to give out a license for you to operate under this name. Now, in addition to credit institutions, we also have financial service institutions, financial companies, Finanzdienstleistungsunternehmen, financial service institutions. They are companies which provide financial services to others commercially or again on a scale that requires a commercially organized business operation and which are not credit institutions. What are some examples? 
uh, proprietary trading, investment brokering, advice, foreign currency dealing, and much, much more. Uh, so these are some companies. What are then finance unternehmen? Not financial service companies, but financial companies. Those are companies which are not credit institutions, investment management companies, or externally managed investment companies, and whose principal activities involve those listed in section two of paragraph one of the German Banking Act, like acquiring and holding ownership interest, claims against payments, leasing companies, trading in financial instruments for own account, etc. So we have three types of financial companies. We have credit institutions, which are basically banks. We have financial service companies and financial companies. And if you go down this list, starting from credit institutions, financial service companies and financial companies, you will have less and less supervision because you have less and less interaction with private customers. Okay. Some other types of financial intermediaries, you don't need to remember this, but again, this is quite, um, quite complicated in the German Banking Act because you need to consider all those different types uh, of financial companies and you need to make sure that all companies that are connected to the financial market are actually regulated. And this is one problem with Wirecard. Uh, large parts of Wirecard weren't under the supervision of BaFin uh, because they couldn't be um, found here in these different legal definitions of um, financial holding companies, financial institutions, etc. Uh, last but not least, uh, you should remember the word bank assurance. What is bank assurance? This is the English term for the German Allfinanz Institute, and it means that you as a company, you offer banking and insurance services. So if you're a bank and an insurance company, this is what we call bank assurance or in German Allfinanz Unternehmen. Okay. So these are the different definitions of the term bank. And now let's continue to the different functions of banks. One way to define the term bank was to show um, what a bank is under German law. A different way of defining a bank is to show what functions a company can offer that make the company a bank. So let's take a look at the most important market functions. A financial market has different important functions. It is important for coordination, allocation and selection of capital. It is important for lot size transformation, Losgrößen transformation and maturity transformation. Um, and last but not least, risk transformation. In every of these uh, aspects, banks, which are in a way also a financial market, they can also um, offer these services and these functions. So let's start with coordination. Financial markets basically help to match lenders with borrowers. I have too much money, I wanna lend money. Someone else needs capital and he or she wants to borrow money. So a financial market could help me find the borrower who I can give money to. Allocation. Financial markets allow for the efficient allocation of scarce resources, in this case capital. So a financial market or a bank could, could help me as an investor find someone whom, to whom I should give my money, to whom should I should give my capital because I can get the best return. Selection. In some cases, access to financial markets is limited by certain regulations. For example, you have a credit score that is just too bad. Uh, you don't have qualification as a trader. You don't have enough capital. You have too much risk. So financial markets could help exclude some market participants and include others. That's also uh, one uh, thing financial markets can achieve. The next lot size transformation. I want to give out 20,000 euros. Someone else only needs a loan of 5,000 euros. What should we do? I can give out 5,000, I wanna give out more. If I only wanna invest 2,000 euros, but someone else needs 500,000 euros for buying a house, we have differences in the lot sizes. Die Losgrößen stimmen nicht überein. So banks can try to do what? They can rake in all the capital from different investors 
with different uh, investment uh, uh, amounts. And then they can take all these little uh, cash sums, they can sum it up and give out large loans. So lot size transformation is definitely one of the functions of modern banks. Next, banks also match investments of different maturities. I want to invest short term. The person who needs a loan for his or her house needs a long term loan. So different maturities can be matched. And how is this done by banks? They take in, uh, usually they take in short term investments and they give out la long term loans. And this is what we call maturity transformation. And you have a maturity mismatch on the balance sheet, on the two balance sheet sides of the bank. So you have short term funding and long term investment when it comes to the maturity transformation of a regular bank. And last but not least, we have risk transformation. Maybe I, as an investor, I want to invest short term and without any large risk. And the bank takes on a loan from a high risk person. So we need to match the acceptable risk when it comes to funding and investment. So this is risk transformation. We have different financial contracts on the asset and the liability side of a bank. And the risk of these different financial contracts of the funding and the investment, they need to be matched by the bank. Okay. Now, in addition to these rather abstract services for their customers, banks also fulfill very important functions for the economy. First of all, they supply and they create money. Banks do not only match borrowers and lenders within a zero sum game, but they are also able to create commercial bank money. Um, Geschäftsbank, Geld ja, und uh, Bankgeldschaffung. Uh, um, this is shown later on when we talk about central banking. Uh, but there are very simple ideas how you can show that actually because you have um, electronic, electronic um, bank accounts, you can create money uh, and banks create money and they increase the money supply uh, within a banking sector. And second, and perhaps most importantly, they provide liquidity by investment services and they facilitate money transfer. The Banken ermöglichen den Zahlungsverkehr. If you don't have a bank account, you cannot pay your rent, you cannot transfer money easily. So this is uh, especially the facilitation of money and capital transfer, Zahlungsverkehr, payment services. This is highly important and one of the most important reasons why banks are supervised and regulated. Okay, now let's concentrate next on the two main areas in banking. Commercial banking, the investment banking. What is the one? What is the other? Now, in addition to the legal definition of the German Banking Act, in addition to the classification and the, um, the specification of the KWG, of the KWG, and in addition to the functions we've just talked about, you can also very roughly separate banks into investment banks and commercial banks. What is commercial banking? Commercial banking basically is traditional banking. It's deposit taking and lending business and also payment services. In contrast, investment banking is everything that is related to capital markets and any service uh, that is related to the capital needs of companies and anything that is related to capital markets. So it could be asset management, trading activities, raising capital, facilitating mergers and acquisitions, facilitating loan acquisitions and all these things. So what is an investment bank? Because for a commercial bank, I think most of you are quite clear what a commercial bank is. If you take a regular Sparkasse, a savings bank or a credit union, they take in deposits on their account, they give out loans, that's a bank, sure. But what is an investment bank? An investment bank is a financial institution that helps their clients, usually large institutional investors, with wealth management, raising capital and trading securities. And in contrast to commercial banks, investment banks do not take deposits, at least not in their investment banking business. 
So what can you do on the so-called buy side and the sell side? Now again, investment banks are concerned about providing their customers with capital, with capital services. And they have a buy side and they have a sell side. On the buy side, they are advising customers what to buy. And on the sell side, they are advising their customers to sell financial products. So on the buy side, for example, you have is this, this is the side of the financial market that buys and invests large portions of securities. Uh, you, as an investment bank, you advise companies regarding future investments. So, for example, if I'm an investment bank and you are Daimler or BMW, I would advise you, maybe you should be buying stocks of, say, Samsung. You should be buying uh, stocks of Apple. Um, you securitize and you, sale, uh, you sell en financially engineered products to investment banks' clients. So this is the buy side. The customer buys something from the investment bank or the investment bank advises the customer what to buy. On the sell side, this is the other side of the financial market. So it deals with the creation, promotion and selling of traded securities to the public. If you are Daimler and you want to raise capital, you want to increase the number of stocks and you want to sell your stocks to other investors, you ask me as an investment bank to advise you, to help you how to sell, sell your stocks, how to sell your bonds. So securities trading, market making, underwriting, IPOs, mergers and acquisitions, but also research, those are the activities you will find on the sell side business of an investment bank. Now, ultimately, the definition of a bank given in the German Banking Act is a description of what we would consider a so-called universal bank, meaning commercial and investment banking. And in Germany, we do have a universal banking system, meaning what? German banks are not restricted from doing commercial or and or investment bank at the same time. They can do both. You can do investment banking and commercial banking, just like, for example, Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank are doing it in Germany. They can offer both commercial banking and investment banking. In some countries, this is forbidden. In some countries, you have what we call a separate banking system where you have to decide, do you want to do investment banking or commercial banking? You cannot do both. Germany is a universal banking system, so most large banks are universal banks. They offer both. That is why um, you have to be careful with this definition. In contrast to commercial banks, investment banks do not take deposits. This is clear. Deutsche Bank does both, but they do not take deposits in their com uh, investment banking activities. This is part of their commercial banking. So be careful when distinguishing commercial from investment banking. So a universal banking system consists of both universal banks. In general, one entity could provide all kinds of services. We call this in German Vollbank Lizenz or the Deposit Taking Institute, Einlagenkredit Institut, meaning that you are allowed to offer any type of banking service in Germany. In a separate banking system, you have to decide commercial banking or investment banking. Okay, so by now you should know what a commercial bank is, what an investment bank is. We'll talk uh, a little bit more in detail about these two types of banking services later on. But for now, let's uh, continue with the peculiarities of the German banking system. Now, the German banking system, as I've told you, is a universal banking system. So we have some universal banks. But of course, we also have specialized banks that have decided freely to only offer a subset of banking services. Now, the universal banks cover the credit banks, Kreditbanken, the private universal banks. We have the savings bank and the cooperative banks or the credit unions. And these are the famous three pillars of the German banking system. Those are the three pillars in German the drei Säulen des deutschen Bankensystems. Private Geschäftsbanken, Sparkassen und Volks- und Raiffeisenbanken. So you have the private sector, the government sector 
and the union sector or the cooperative sector. Those are the three sectors, the three pillars of the German banking system. Some specialty banks include specialized credit institutions. We have mortgage banks, investment companies, and so on. Um, but usually um, most banks are larger, only the savings banks and the credit unions, they are smaller in size. Now, you could also argue that the German banking system, of course, doesn't only exist and consist of these banks, but they also consist of the European Central Bank, the ECB, Deutsche Bundesbank, as part of the European Central Banking System, and BaFin, the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority in Bonn. Side note, again, the German banking system is a universal banking system. If you do find a credit institution that has specialized on, say, investment banking, this is for its on, on the basis of its own decision. It doesn't have um, to decide. It can offer both, just like Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank do. So this is important to keep in mind. This is a, a, a plot and a table, no, it's a, it's a graph from uh, the Hartmann Wendels Pfingsten Weber Buch. Uh, you do have universal banks, the three pillars, and you have some specialized bank, especially uh, the online direct banks here. Uh, they are probably very large, uh, but you also have some um, uh, mortgage banks and their uh, papier sammelbanken, so, so investment companies, but uh, Actually, this one, these three pillars are the most important ones. Okay, We do have BaFin, we have European Central Bank and Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, and last but not least, we also have the affiliates. Where's my cursor? This here. We have the affiliates of um, foreign banks operating in Germany. And we have the affiliates of, and subsidiaries of German banks that operate in other countries. And sometimes they are also supervised by uh, BaFin, but also by the foreign regulators and supervisors. Okay. Let's start with the private banks, the private Geschäftsbanken. The first of the three pillars. Uh, most important fact about the private business uh, and private banks is they are privately owned. Um, usually you have profit maximization and shareholder value as the sole business objective and they trade under the legal form of a stock company uh, or a so-called Kommanditgesellschaft of Aktien. So these are stock companies and this is important. If you ever see a bank that operates as a stock company, as a, as a corporation, um, it's a private bank. And they often have their focus on investment banking, securities business, uh, and very few ones like Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank are universal banks. Now, why is it important to stress that they operate as a stock company? Well, you do have some companies, some banks that operate under the legal form of a general partnership that is the German OHG, Offene Handelsgesellschaft, or a limited partnership that's a Kommanditgesellschaft. But those are called private banks or private bankers or banking houses, Bankhäuser oder Privatbanken. Uh, this is something weird or something um, special in Germany. Historically, we have had some banks that have been around for centuries, even before German stock companies and the German Stock Act uh, were put in place. For example, Berenberg Bank, Bankhaus Lampe, Saal Oppenheim, very, very old, very famous banks. Um, and they are still allowed, according to paragraph 32 of the German Banking Act, they are still allowed to operate as a general or a limited partnership. But those are exception, exceptions. They are allowed to continue operation under these legal forms, but you cannot found a new company as a limited or a general partnership. This is no longer allowed since 1976. Why? Because the German um, regulator thinks that these 
uh, that banks shouldn't be allowed to operate as a general partnership or a limited partnership. Those are exceptions that were made for very famous banking houses, Bankhäuser, um, that um, existed even centuries ago. And most of these banking houses or these private bankers, they offer services in the field of private banking or wealth management and investment banking. Be careful, private banking is not to be um, is uh, not to be misunderstood by uh, retail banking. If you as a student go to a bank and open an account, this is retail banking. This is not the German Privatkundengeschäft. Private banking is uh, banking and offering financial services to wealthy customers. So usually banks will require that you have at least 1 million euros uh, of assets under management by this bank, so you need to open an account with a lot of money. So that's why, or that's what private banking is. Now, the private banks in Germany consist basically of the four large banks, Deutsche Bank plus Postbank, Commerzbank and H4B, Hypovereinsbank, Unicredit. Uh, Hypovereinsbank is a very large bank that was bought by uh, Unicredito, used to be called like that, and it's now Unicredit, a large banking company from uh, Milan, from Italy, and uh, H4B, Hypovereinsbank, is its German subsidiary, and this is one of the large four major branch banks, or the Filialbanken. Uh, there are some banks that operate only regionally, for example, Nationalbank, Südwestbank, and we have the large direct internet banks, ING Diba, Comdirect uh, used to be, and uh, DKB. Uh, so these are internet banks. We also have foreign banks, uh, Banco Santander, which is called Santander Bank in Germany. Some people call it Santander Bank, but uh, it's a Spanish city of Santander. Uh, Targo Bank uh, used to be um, the branch of Citigroup until Citigroup in 2008 sold uh, what used to be called Citibank in Germany, uh, then to Credit Mutuel, and since then it has been called Targo Bank. And we also have some banks like ABN Amro, which only operate branches in Germany uh, to cater to their uh, customers from, for example, the Netherlands. And then we have some private mortgage banks, private building societies, Bausparkasse, Hypo Real Estate, and so on. Now, the private banks um, are represented by a lobby group, which is the Bundesverband Deutscher Banken e.V. And they also operate the Compensation Fund of German Banks and the Deposit Protection Fund of the Association of German Banks, Entschädigungseinrichtungen und Einlagensicherungsfonds des Bundesverbandes Deutscher Banken. Those are the deposit insurance schemes for this pillar. So if a bank fails within this first pillar of private banks in Germany, the customers, the depositors, are being paid back their deposits from this deposit protection fund of the German Federal Association of German Banks, beim Bundesverband. In 2010, we had approximately 200 private banks. Uh, in 2006, there used to be 357. And obviously, the number of banks is decreasing, as is the number of branches. Branches are being cut down, they are being closed down and um, rationalized. And this is, yeah, the German first pillar uh, with private banks. Um, you can see here an abstract from the annual report of Deutsche Bank. Uh, you can immediately see that it has a pretty large, uh, pretty huge um, income statement and balance sheet. For example, in 2014, they reported a net income of almost 1.7 um, billion euros and they had net interest income of 14 billion euros. So pretty good year back then. And they had close to 2 trillion euros, 2 billion euro. This is given in million euros. So the Total assets were close to 2 trillion, 2 billion euros in 2014. And those were the liability side, this liability side of the balance sheet. Uh, just uh, a quick 
look at the equity. Uh, we'll deal about this and talk about this later on. But notice the ridiculously small amount of 68 million, no, 68 billion uh, equity, uh, euros in equity, compared to almost 1.7 trillion euros in assets. This is very special for Deutsche Bank, but it's also very common for most banks that you have an equity ratio that is much, much lower uh, for a bank than it would be, for example, for an industrial company. Okay, so let's turn to the second pillar of the German banking sector. Public sector, public credit institutions, Sparkasse. Now, public sector credit institutions, they are usually held completely or mainly by the state, by the government. Um, by state, I mean usually the county or a city, Kreis oder Stadt. So normally the federation, a federal state, a community, an administrative union or another public agency is the owner uh, or responsible body of the bank, either Stadt oder Kreis. They owe their existence to specific public interests. The government didn't found these banks for no reason, but usually it was to supply a population with money or with credit, with loans. And often, but not always, they have the legal form of a public agency institution, which means in German, Anstalt des öffentlichen Rechts. So it's not uh, a private company, it's not a stock company, but it's actually um, a legal form that belongs to the state, to the government. And in many cases, they restrict business to this particular city or to this particular county, and they only offer specific banking products. Now in Germany, the following banks are considered to be the public sector credit institutions. You start with Deutsche Bundesbank, which is the federal central bank. You have Dekabank Deutsche Zero Zentrale, which is the head institute for the whole savings bank sector. You have the different Landesbanken, the, the state banks, which are state-owned regional banks like Hilaba, Bayern LB, Nord LB, LBBW. You have savings banks. Actually, this number is decreasing by the day. It used to be 417 independent savings banks or savings banks and independent savings banks like Hasper. You have some public law, real estate credit agencies. You don't really need to be concerned about these. What is interesting is KFW, KFW. What is KFW? The Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, the public sector bank, federal bank for reconstruction, was founded after the Second World War to help Germany rebuild. Um, obviously, Germany has been rebuilt by then, uh, and KFW is now the basically um, the bank of the uh, federal government by which it can uh, stimulate um, and can support. Uh, economic policy. For example, all those um, uh, emergency loans given out by the federal government now as part of our pandemic plan, most of these loans are given out by the KFW, by KfW, because this is uh, the house bank, so to say, of the federal government. Okay. Now in 2006, savings banks in Germany had 14,000 branches. They are famous for a huge uh, system of branches and they're cutting down on branches every day now. And they had total assets of around 1 trillion euro. Uh, the institutional liability, uh, which in German we call Anstaltslast, and the guarantor liability, the Gewährträgerhaftung, they were very important for the public sector banks until 2005, which meant that because they are state-owned, you always have a public uh, body, a city or a council or a land, um, a state in the background as the owner of this public sector bank. And because these um, um, regional bodies uh, are virtually default free and have no risk of default, the banks themselves were almost risk free. And this gave them an advantage uh, in um, the banking sector within the European Union. And this is why the European Union abolished uh, both these guarantees uh, based on an initiative of the EU Commission, because the EU Commission said that German banks, if we want one uh, common and one single banking sector, one banking union, 
Um, German banks need to compete with Spanish banks and Italian banks and French banks in all European Union countries. But it also means that German banks should not have an advantage over banks from other countries and the German state should not protect savings banks. This is why the European Union Commission abolished these two guarantees and nowadays uh, savings banks have to compete with other private banks and credit unions. This is the um, balance sheet of HASPA. As you can see, uh, public sector credit institutions, especially Sparkas and savings banks, they have a huge focus on deposit taking and lending. So you see lending here on the asset side and you see deposits here. Where's my cursor here? Um, so that's basically what they do. Deposit taking and lending. Okay, and last but not least, we have the third pillar, the cooperative credit institutions. Now the most important feature is that it's a cooperative. Eine eingetragene Genossenschaft, wenn Sie eine Bank sehen, that is followed, where, where the name is followed by E and capital G für eingetragene Genossenschaft, then this is a credit union. This is a cooperative. And it means that uh, the liable equity capital consists of the credit balances of the members. So every client is a member and every member is a client. So shareholders are clients, etc. They usually only do regional business. They primarily grant loans. And in this respect, they are very similar to savings banks. And again, they are registered cooperative companies. And uh, this is what uh, is so special about the credit unions. Now, we do have, again, one central group institute, which is the DZ Bank in Frankfurt, the DZ Bank. And it acts and it functions as sort of a central bank for the whole third pillar with approximately, and again, the number of this is decreasing. We have to uh, look at the current number here. Uh, we have approximately 1,000 credit operatives and approximately 10 Spa and Darlehensbanken. We have five so-called PSD banks. Those are pure retail banks. Some specialized institutions that offer special services to all those member cooperatives, which is union investment. This is the asset manager for all cooperative banks and RNV insurance, RNV Versicherung, which is the insurance company for the whole pillar, for this whole sector. And also, last but not least, some specialized cooperative, for example, church-owned banks. We have one bank that is owned by the Catholic Church. And the largest cooperative is actually Apobank. If you come out of, the, uh, at, of Leipzig Central Station, take a look at the buildings and the advertisements on those buildings right in front of German, of Leipzig Central Station, and you will see Apobank, Ärzte und Apotheker Bank, which is a credit union that was formed by pharmacists and physicians because they have, they realized that uh, if you start out as a doctor, as a pharmacist after your studies, it is very difficult for you to get a loan for setting up your business, for setting up your practice, going to a regular bank. And that's why they formed their own uh, credit union. So these are the 10 biggest banking companies in Germany, it used to be in 2012 changes every now and then of course deutsche bank commerzbank kfw dz bank unicredit the landesbank baden württemberg lbbw lbbw had to buy the former sachsen lb um, the former uh, uh, landesbank of saxony so this is why we have lbbw here in uh, leipzig as well uh, not LB, Landesbank, Hessen, Thüringen, Helaba and Postbank. So these are the different um, the different um, banks in Germany. And to get a better idea, here are the number of institutions, the number of branches. So it's pretty much uh, equally distributed between uh, the credit unions and the savings banks when it comes to uh, branches. But every bank is closing down branches because more and more online banking is done, especially now in times of the COVID pandemic. Okay, and this is also 
um, a table which should give you an idea where the money is. Usually it's pretty much in uh, the deposits of non-banks, which is customer deposits, and they give out loans to banks and also to non-banks, that is customers like you. And yeah, we can skip this. You can have a look at these statistics and you can also uh, take some uh, more recent statistics from Deutsche Bundesbank uh, to get a better idea of uh, which importance each pillar has. But one can say that those three pillars are equally important for the jump banking system. Okay, so this was uh, a first introduction to the jump banking sector. Um, by now you should know how to define a bank, which main functions a bank has. You should know that we have the German Banking Act, the KWG, Kreditwesengesetz, which is the most important piece of legislation we have in German banking at least. And you should know about the three pillars of the German banking system. So this is, I guess, enough for today. I will not start the second chapter already. Um, if you do have any questions, please wait um, in the big blue button room. Uh, you can ask some questions. Um, and thank you for your attention up to this point and uh, see you in the next lecture. Thank you.